let's talk about the data because it is kind of scary. Uh, you know, magnesium is so important and I'm going to explain why in a minute, but it looks like about 50% uh, of Americans are not getting enough magnesium. And why is that? It's because uh, there's a decrease in our diet and the magnesium in our foods because of processed foods. The soils are, are not able to actually uh, give the plants the magnesium because they're so depleted and lack organic matter that the bacteria you know, in the, in the soil help the plants extract the magnesium from the soil. Uh, we drink a lot of coffee, alcohol, sugar, all which deplete magnesium. We're stressed, stress depletes magnesium. So there's a lot of reason why we have low magnesium and it's super common and it, it it's so common that it links, it's linked to heart disease. It's linked to so many chronic illnesses uh, and the costs are huge. So what are the signs of magnesium deficiency? Now, when I first started learning about this, I was shocked because I had treated all sorts of problems when I was in medical school, when I was a resident, as a doctor. And so many symptoms we didn't even think of as being related to magnesium, but they are like muscle cramps or muscle twitching, insomnia, anxiety, irritability, uh, sensitivity to now loud noises, palpitations in your heart, constipation, spasms in your butt, anal spasms, headaches, migraines, uh, fibromyalgia, uh, chronic fatigue, high blood pressure, PMS, menstrual cramps, irritable bowel, all these are, and lots more are connected to magnesium. It's a critical mineral. It is involved in over six or 700 chemical, different chemical reactions in the body. Uh, it is the fourth most abundant mineral in your body. And it, it plays a role in so many different chemical reactions that if you don't have enough of it, your body starts not to work. So anything that's irritable or twitchy or crampy, it's likely magnesium deficiency. And that's why I call magnesium the relaxation mineral because it just relaxes everything. Think about taking an Epsom salt bath, which is magnesium sulfate. It relaxes you at night and it relaxes your muscles and it helps form muscles because it, it helps the recovery of the muscles. Your muscles need magnesium in order to relax. Uh, so it's super, super important and it, and it works on so many different levels in the body. So, and I, you know, when I was in medical school, it's kind of a joke because, you know, it's, it's kind of the last resort we use when nothing else was working and none of the drugs worked. So for example, if someone came in with a heart attack and they went into a, an arrhythmia where their heart was just beating out of control, oh, we give them all these drugs, epinephrine, this drug, that drug. And then at the last resort, if nothing else works, we give them intravenous magnesium. <laughs> Why don't we do that first? You know, or uh, if, for example, they're having seizures uh, and they're, for example, from preeclampsia, which is a, a pregnancy condition, what do we do? We give them, which is, you know, irritability of the brain, we give them magnesium. Or if a woman comes in in, in preterm labor, like, you know, where their uterus is contracting, then all of a sudden uh, it's an emergency, right? The baby's going to deliver. We give them intravenous magnesium as a treatment. <laughs> If, uh, if someone is constipated and their bowels are not are spas and their spasm basically are not going, we give them magnesium citrate. Uh, if we're doing a colonoscopy prep, we give them magnesium or milk of magnesium. You might've heard about that. So we use it all the time in life-threatening situations in the emergency room and the ICU and the cardiac intensive care unit. And it's kind of makes me laugh that we don't think about using it just everyday medicine. So there's over 116,000 different medical references on magnesium. And because it's not a drug, nobody's pushing it. You don't really hear that much about it. But it's super common. Uh, apparently 65% of people admitted to the ICU, the intensive care unit, have magnesium deficiency. Uh, so if you want to stay out of the ICU, take magnesium. Uh, it also seems to be about 45% of the population that's not getting enough magnesium in their diet. And if you check your blood magnesium level, it's not that great because that 99% of the magnesium is in your cells. So by the time it's low in your blood, you're really screwed. So the key is to do red cell magnesium, but there's also another test called magnesium loading, but it's such a safe mineral. Unless you have kidney failure, you can't hurt yourself with it. You'll just get diarrhea if you take too much of it. So, um, so why, are, why are we so deficient? Well, I mentioned a little bit of the reasons. Uh, most of the foods we can eat contain no magnesium. What do you get magnesium? Nuts, seeds, grains, and beans, and greens. And not the staples of most people's diet. All the processed food has no magnesium. Sugar uh, in our refined diet 
uh, has no magnesium. So uh, it's really low in most of the foods we eat. And a lot of we, what we do, like I said, we drink too much alcohol, we drink too much coffee, uh, we have soda, like uh, colas are full of phosphoric acid that depletes magnesium. Uh, often if you're sweating a lot, like I exercise and I sweat a lot, I, I make sure I take electrolytes because I want to replenish my magnesium. Uh, stress. I, I read a study about Kosovo during, during the Balkan War. And, and if you had high levels of stress, people would excrete more magnesium. They literally pee it out. Uh, so antibiotics uh, are a factor. Diuretics. People you take for high blood pressure. High blood pressure is blood vessels that are too spasmy. And magnesium helps relax them. But one of the drugs we use is a diuretic to really kind of remove fluid from the body. But that causes you to lose magnesium. So it's kind of weird. Um, so there's a lot of things that, that are, are a factor. But most of the problems that we have are just because of our crappy diet and our lack of magnesium in our foods. So uh, make sure you get plenty of those foods like nuts, seeds, avocados, beans, dark oh, chocolate. That's a good one. Dark chocolate's a good one for magnesium. And also uh, sea vegetables, seaweed. I encourage you to eat seaweed. Great. Great source of magnesium. Um, now you need a lot of other minerals and vitamins with magnesium to make them work like B6, vitamin D, selenium. Uh, so you need those all to kind of work together as a team. Uh, and we want to make sure we don't keep losing magnesium. So cut down on the alcohol, the sugar, the coffee, the colas, uh, learn how to relax. <laughs> uh, meditation is super powerful and, uh, make sure you look at your drugs. A lot of people talk about, you know, nutrient drug interactions, like, oh, we shouldn't be taking this because, you know, oh, don't, don't take too much of vitamin K or whatever because you're taking a blood thinner. Okay, fine. That's right. But, but what about the other way around? There, the drugs interfere with your vitamins and minerals. So like if you're taking an acid blocking drug, you're going to prevent B12 absorption and even magnesium and, and zinc absorption. Uh, or if you're taking a diuretic, you're going to lose magnesium. So you want to make sure that you reduce your uh, drugs, if you can, or switch to different drugs that are not, that are not depleting the, the, the nutrients or that you actually take the nutrients as a replacement. Now let's talk about supplements because I think that, uh, you know, we need to be thinking about how do we get enough magnesium. So diet is first, right? Getting rid of the things that cause you to lose magnesium is second. Uh, and then we need to be taking probably 300, 400 milligrams a day. I take about four or 600. I take it at night. It's great for sleep. It's great for insomnia. It's great for muscle cramps. It's great for constipation. It's great for headaches. It's great for anxiety. It's great for palpitations. It's great for so, so many things. Um, but you might need more. I mean, some people need up to a thousand milligrams. I just tell you a quick magnesium story of a patient. She was a, a, re a radiation oncology resident. So she was a doctor and she suffered terrible migraines. And she came to see me and she started telling me about these migraines that were so bad. She had to take, you know, narcotics and Zofran, which is like a chemo drug for nausea. And, and she still could barely function. And she was going to have to quit her residency. And she, you know, she worked all this time to be a doctor, but she couldn't function. I said, okay, well, now, now as, a, as a functional medicine doctor, I just don't want to know about her headaches. I want to know about everything. So I started talking about all of her symptoms. It's, oh, anxiety, palpitations muscle cramps, constipation. I said, how often do you go to the bathroom? She said, well, I'm pretty regular. I said, well, how often do you go? She said, well, I go every week. I'm like, what do you mean? That's not regular. So it's regular for me. I go every week. <laughs> I'm like, no, you're supposed to go every day or two or three times a day. <laughs> By the way, that's how often you're supposed to go. And so she was severely magnesium depleted. I gave her a thousand or milligrams or even more over a number of days. And she dramatically changed. Her headaches went away, her constipation went away, her palpitations, her anxiety, her insomnia, her muscle cramps all went away by getting enough magnesium. Now, what kind of magnesium should you take? They're not all the same. If you take magnesium carbonate or magnesium oxide, those are things you'll get in a drugstore maybe in crappy cheap magnesium, but it's not absorbed well. So you want to get chelated magnesium. You want to get uh, magnesium glycinate or citrate if you tend to be more constipated. Magnesium threonate is great for the brain. There's many, many different kinds of magnesiums that you can take, but do not take this, the carbonate or the oxide because uh, those are, or the uh, gluconate, those tend not to be, to be uh, very well absorbed. Um, now, if you take too much magnesium citrate, you'll get diarrhea. So you want to use magnesium glycinate. Um, you take them with other minerals and a multi-mineral complex. Also, hot bath is great. Epsom salt baths. I love that every night, especially in the winter with some lavender drops. It really relaxes me. Magnesium relaxes me and I just drop right off to sleep. So magnesium Epsom salt baths are great. Um, 
And you know, one caveat, if you have kidney disease, you can take too much magnesium. So you want to be careful there. But work with your doctor about that. So magnesium is super important. It's a relaxation mineral. We're all low in it pretty much. Uh, stop doing the things that make you lose magnesium. Start doing the things that make you actually get magnesium in your diet and keep the magnesium in your body and take the right supplements. One of the most important things to understand about your health and whether you have it or don't, and it's because it drives so many of the diseases we see today in modern civilization. So many things uh, from diabetes, to obesity, to heart disease, to cancer, to autoimmune disease, to asthma, to depression, to autism, to ADD. I mean, you name it, basically, it's connected to our gut and our microbiome. And most people don't really understand what that is or what a leaky gut is or what to do about it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, functional medicine really focuses on leaky gut because it's so central to treating people. In fact, the first thing I do when I evaluate a patient is I want to make sure their gut's healthy because if their gut's not healthy, then the rest of the stuff we're going to do may not work as well. And it's really important to understand how to assess, diagnose, and treat a leaky gut. Now, you're probably wondering, what the hell am I talking about? We're going to get into that in a minute. But basically, your gut is the seat of your health. It's where... 70 to 80% of your immune system lives, 90% of the serotonin, you have a whole second brain there, it's called the second brain or the enteric nervous system, it regulates uh, mood, digestion, sleep, uh, it's pretty impressive. So we have to get our gut healthy, we have to understand that if we don't, our immune system is going to be activated because our immune system is there to defend us from outside invaders and the place where you're exposed to the most stuff is your gut. Every day you're putting pounds of stuff in there, lots of food, you have bacteria in your gut. And all that's kind of foreign, and your body's supposed to know what to do with it, which is keep it out. Now, the food's supposed to be digested. It's supposed to break down into its component parts, amino acids, fatty acids, uh, uh, simple sugars, carbohydrates that we actually can absorb and that are deconstructed from their original identity. In other words, when you eat a piece of chicken, you don't become chicken, right? <laughs> it breaks it down into its component parts. So we can reuse them for ourselves. Now, when you have a leaky gut, that doesn't happen. You start to get things leaking over the membrane and causing inflammation. The immune system is right there to protect you. And you get lots of problems when you have a leaky gut, which is um, a, a driver of so much uh, disease. So, So what is exactly a leaky gut and what does it mean? Well, basically you've got an entire intestinal tract that has only one cell lining. In other words, only one cell between you and a sewer. So on one side is poop and food, and the other side is your bloodstream and your immune system. And if those interact, it's a problem. <laughs> you want the food to go through your cells. They get filtered through the cell, not between the cells. And, and the broken down food components that are the basic building blocks of what you need to survive are just filtered through the cells and get into your bloodstream and everything's hunky-dory. When those cells, uh, that single cell lining, which basically is spread out the size of a tennis court, when it's uh, damaged, and this like Legos uh, stuck together, the Legos come apart. And then food and bacteria and other toxins leak in and get exposed to your immune system, which triggers an immune response. So we talked a lot about on the podcast, inflammation, its role in aging, its role in chronic disease, pretty much in everything. If you have inflammation, it's really driving everything that's going wrong with you today in society. Every chronic disease, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, dementia, obesity, autoimmune disease, allergies, autism, depression, you name it, it's inflammatory. And aging itself is inflammatory. We call it inflammaging. And a lot of that is because of problems in the gut. In fact, one of the hallmarks of aging now is problems with the microbiome. I added that in my book and it wasn't in, in the hallmarks when I wrote the book, but it was just so obvious to me that it was. Then they finally added it when the scientists got back together. But basically you 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 want you have a you know think about your your gut lining as a coffee filter. It lets in the right stuff and keeps out the bad stuff. It's like imagine if your coffee filter had holes, it'd be coffee grounds in your coffee, not a good thing. When these kind of connections, these tight junctions we call them, loosen up then you get into trouble. And that and that is what causes uh, all the problems, what we call increased intestinal permeability, that's the medical term for it, uh, or leaky gut, which is the easier way to think about it. And then, you know, you get bacterial toxins, viruses, food proteins leaking through, the immune system goes crazy, and that creates, you know, all these 
downstream problems. It may show up as food sensitivities. It may show up as, you know, inflammation that leads to obesity or diabetes, uh, but essentially it's all driving inflammation. And why do we get a leaky gut? What causes a leaky gut? Well, there's no single cause, but a lot of things cause problems. First, our diet. Our diet just sucks. We have highly processed diet. We have a diet that's low in fiber, high in inflammatory foods, high in food components that actually damage the gut. In fact, they add in something called microbial transglutaminase, which is like glue that sticks the food together that's processed food. Transglutaminase is one of the components of gluten. And so that's what causes celiac disease. So they're basically putting it in the food. You can't even tell because it's not on the label, but it actually is there and it, it damages the gut. Emulsifiers, all the thickeners, additives, that all damages our gut and cause a leaky gut. Uh, there's other things too, besides our you know, highly processed, low fiber, high sugar, chemical laden diet, uh, antibiotics, lots of antibiotics, uh, certain medications like Advil, steroids, certain hormones, um, acid blocking drugs like Pepsid, all these things disrupt the gut microbiome and lead to changes that can lead to leaky gut. Also environmental toxins, whether they're petrochemical toxins, pesticides, plastics, um, heavy metals, all disrupt the gut lining. And glyphosate particularly is bad. Glyphosate is a microbiome destroyer that's on 70% of food crops. It's in everybody's urine. A recent study from the EPA found that most people have glyphosate in the urine. I check mine. I, I'm really careful of what I eat and I travel, but I can't always control where the food's coming from. And since most crops have glyphosate, I'm going to get it. Um, also, gluten is a big one. Gluten is probably, from a food perspective, the biggest driver of leaky gut, it basically produces something called zonulin, which interrupts the tight junctions and ends up causing problems with with this leaky gut. And it, and that's really why we see so many in autoimmune inflammatory diseases with gluten. Uh, also, um, if you have imbalanced gut flora, bad bacteria, if you have yeast overgrowth, bad bacterial overgrowth, just imbalanced in the dis, this microbiome and dysbiosis, that can that can also really cause a problem. So there's a lot of things, even stress, you know, chronic stress, like just, you know, itself, if they take healthy young recruits and they march them overnight in the military, they'll have a leaky gut in the morning. It's just because stress also causes that. And the other thing that's really bad is high fructose corn syrup. So why is high fructose corn syrup bad? Well, basically <laughs> it takes a lot of energy to absorb fructose and high fructose corn syrup, it's free fructose. It's not embedded in a in a matrix of fruit where you normally find it. And the uh, fructose doesn't get absorbed easily like glucose, it requires energy. And it basically depletes ATP or the energy source in our gut. And when you deplete ATP, those tight junctions that are keeping like Legos, your, your gut cells together, they, they get weak. And so then the energy can't hold the tight junctions together because you're not making enough ATP to deal with all the fructose being absorbed and the demand for ATP from fructose absorption, and you end up getting a leaky gut. So literally fructose can punch holes in the gut if you're having a lot of high fructose corn syrup. So kind of bad news. So how do you know if you have a leaky gut? Well, sometimes it's obvious because you have all sorts of symptoms, but anybody with chronic gut issues like you know irritable bowel, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, uh, obviously inflammatory bowel disease, uh, skin issues. If you have skin issues like eczema, acne, psoriasis, for sure you have a leaky gut. If you have arthritis, joint pain, autoimmune disease, headaches, uh, fatigue, trouble concentrating, brain fog. Uh, if you tend to have hormonal issues, it may be a factor. Autoimmune diseases, for sure, it's number one on my list if you have an autoimmune disease. Uh, if you're overweight, if you have diabetes, there's a whole phenomenon called metabolic endotoxemia, which essentially shows that you have um, bacterial toxins being crossing this leaky gut, being absorbed, activating your immune system. The immune system makes you insulin resistant and you get more weight gain and diabetes. Also, it's been linked to heart disease, to Alzheimer's, obviously depression, ADD, autism, all these uh, symptoms. And there's lots more that are clues that you might have a leaky gut. So what do you do? What if you have a leaky gut? How do you heal it? Well, the only way to heal it is to follow uh, the functional medicine framework, which we call the 5R program to heal the gut. And we've talked a little bit about this, but I'm going to review it. But you probably will need to work with a functional medicine doctor, but you can reset your microbiome. You can repair your leaky gut and you can do it by, by basically the few steps. The first is remove the bad stuff, right? Get rid of bad bugs in there, 
get rid of overgrowth of yeast, overgrowth of bacteria, parasites, whatever's in there that shouldn't be in there, get rid of it. Also, you want to get rid of foods that are irritating to the gut, potential food sensitivities, gluten, dairy, soy, eggs. Uh, also, sugar is really bad. It just causes things that are a problem. Alcohol is really bad. So make sure you get rid of those things and see you know, if, if that reduces the inflammation. Also, watch out for the gut-busting drugs, right? Antibiotics, anti-inflammatory drugs like Advil, uh, steroids, acid blockers, really bad. So reduce or eliminate those drugs, and most of the time we don't need those. Uh, finally, environmental toxins can be a factor. So I, for example, had leaky gut from having really high levels of mercury, and so you want to make sure you you reduce your exposures. EWG.org has a whole great website for identifying how to reduce exposure from food, from household cleaning products, from skincare products. Uh, you might want to make sure you, you know, filter your water, get a HEPA filter for your air, just reduce your overall toxic exposure, and also sort of mitigate uh, the stress in your life. We'll talk about that in a minute. Then once you've kind of done that, you want to help rebuild and repair your gut. And so you want to kind of focus on biome builders and how do you build your build your healthy gut back. First is make sure you have enough fiber, 25 to 50 grams of fiber, ideally from veggies, uh, not, uh, not obviously processed grains, uh, nuts and seeds, lots of veggies. The, the gut loves polyphenols. They love the colorful fruits and vegetables. So make sure you have plenty of those with polyphenols, berries. Try to eat organic when possible. Use EWG's guide for the, the clean 15 for the least contaminated uh, fruits and veggies or the dirty dozen. Avoid those which are the most contaminated. Um, have prebiotic foods, right? Uh, things like uh, Jerusalem artichokes, garlic, onions, leeks, dandelion greens, jicama, chicory, asparagus, um, plantains, all are great sources of prebiotics. Uh, probiotic foods, also important. Um, sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, fermented soy, like natto, uh, tempeh, unsweetened yogurt, kefir, miso. These are all great, great sources of, of uh, probiotics. Bone broth is great. Uh, bone broth has a lot of gut healing components in it, collagen and very anti-inflammatory. You might need certain supplements as well, things like zinc, uh, glutamine, curcumin, uh, evening primrose oil, vitamin A, the list goes on. But basically the idea is you can really rebuild your gut through managing uh, a better uh, diet, a better lifestyle, and figuring out what the root causes are. Now, sometimes you might need a functional medicine doctor, but uh, a lot of times you can do this on your own. Now, <laughs> 1,500 years ago, or maybe a while ago, uh, uh, Hippocrates said all diseases begin in the gut. Ayurveda also talks about if your gut's not healthy, you're not healthy. Uh, and he was right. Um, and the data is really clear today that our guts are a mess, that we need to uh, optimize our gut function, that we need to uh, basically fix the problems that we have with our, our microbiome. And uh, and that, you know, fixing and, and, and treating a leaky gut is a critical part of staying healthy. Um, so I encourage you to do a gut check, see where you're at, see what's going on with your digestion. Uh, and follow the guidelines we just talked about. I've written also a lot about it. There's lots of blogs. We'll link to them in the show notes. And uh, I think you're, if you do that, you're going to be better in every way. And I can't tell you how many patients I've seen get rid of so many issues, whether it's skin issues, mood issues, digestive issues, autoimmune diseases, um, ADD, autism. It's just by fixing the gut. People kind of get inflammation. Well, I have a sore throat. Okay, that's inflammation. Or, you know, I have an autoimmune disease. Or I have allergies. Or I have asthma. And people sort of get that's inflammation. But most people don't really know that other diseases that, that I mentioned, like heart disease, cancer, obesity, diabetes, aging itself, uh, depression, autism, um, are all either caused by or somehow affected by inflammation in our bodies. And by the way, just to say, everybody, the reason why Americans were only 4% of the population but suffered 16% of the cases and deaths from COVID was not because we have a bad healthcare system. It's because we were all pre-inflamed because we were living and eating and doing things in a way that make us pre-inflamed. So when COVID hits us, it starts a wildfire. It's like dropping a match in a dry forest, you know? So it creates a wildfire. And that's exactly what COVID was. It was a wildfire in our bodies that killed so many of us. So kind of take us through why, why are we having so much inflammation uh, and what, what is it? How do we kind of identify it? Sure. Well, just going back to the basics, inflammation is actually an ancestral force that evolved 
to protect us from things like pathogens and poisons and traumas, all of these ancient killers. So it's actually a good thing in our bodies to have inflammation when we need it. But the problem is that because we've evolved these strong, robust immune responses, we also tend to pay a price for it. And this is called the biological price of having a strong immune system. And we can see that with autoimmune diseases, for example, like rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease. But now what we're seeing is that we've also transformed our modern environments from the food we eat to the air we breathe to how we move, how we interact with others in terms of social connections. So our immune systems are constantly triggered at a low level. And this leads to chronic silent inflammation in the bodies. And we know today that this type of inflammation can actually be an independent cause of disease. And it is tied to a variety of modern chronic diseases. The majority of our top killers is tied to heart disease, cancer, diabetes, neurodegenerative disorders, some psychiatric issues, obesity. So what we're seeing today is that the majority of us in the modern world are inflamed. Yeah. Most people don't walk around going, oh, I'm inflamed. Like if you if you got a rash or you have a sore throat, you know I'm inflamed, right? If you have a arthritis in your knee and it's swollen up, you go, I got, I got a problem. But most people who are overweight or have heart disease or high blood pressure or diabetes or depression, they're not walking around thinking, oh, I'm inflamed. I better deal with that, right? Right, absolutely. So explain how inflammation plays a role there because we think of inflammation typically as being something that is there to fight infection or immune system to, that gets activated to fight cancer. Uh, but, and then can get dysregulated with autoimmunity and allergy, but we don't think of it in terms of sort of this general state of being kind of low grade inflammation, which we're all suffering. Right. And, and I think that's a great point is that we don't tend to think of inflammation as being so broad. For example, we, when we think of inflammation, we think of autoimmune disorders, typical autoimmune disorders, or as you said, when we have a cold or a flu, but now what we're seeing is that low level inflammation can actually cause some of these disorders, or it is tied to nearly all of these modern chronic disorders. And you're right that if you go into your doctor's office, your typical Western uh, physician's office, you're unlikely to be offered a test for inflammation. So the question is, how exactly do you know that you're inflamed? And I think there are a lot of things that are coming up these days. For example, in cardiology clinics, uh, uh, doctors might test you for something called C-reactive protein, high sensitivity. Yeah. C-reactive protein, and and that's a marker of inflammation in the body. It's uh, made in the liver in response to areas of inflammation. And there are a variety of other markers as well, but some of the problems with these tests is that they may not be that specific. So if you have elevated C-reactive protein, you may have that elevation from the cold you have, and you cannot be sure where it's coming from in your body, how long it's been there for. But, you know, there are new markers being developed. There are inflammatory signatures, for example. There was a Stanford study a couple of years ago on aging and an inflammatory signature comprised of several markers that can help to predict healthy aging. And, you know, there are so many different things that are in the works, I think, from tests like CAT scans and MRIs that can pick up inflammation around blood vessels, for example, and predict which plaques are most likely to rupture. So... So those are some of the things. And one of the proxies for being inflamed that we can all look at when we go to our primary care physician's office is, is just, you know, things like high blood sugar or diabetes. If you have prediabetes or diabetes, you are most likely to have some amount of inflammation in the body because high blood sugar does tend to create inflammation. And if you have that belly fat, for example, then you also know that you most likely have some level of inflammation in the body because we know that the belly fat is a marker for the fat that wraps around your internal abdominal organs. Yeah. I mean, that, that, by the way, that fat, right, is a source of a lot of inflammation because it's not just, you know, the belly fat is not just holding up your pants. It's actually a very active immune hormonal organ that's spewing out all kinds of inflammatory signals if you get this excess belly fat. And I think most people don't realize that. If you have a big belly, you've got a smoldering fire inside of you. And, and uh, that is really important to understand. And the reason we get the big belly is because of what we're eating. So, you know, let's talk about, you know, you know, the, um, the some of the things you we were talking about, like, how do we know, right? So, so we can do a CRP, but it's not very specific. It doesn't tell us why it, uh, 
you know, there are other markers. We mentioned uh, Stanford research. I think that was uh, David Furman's work on the thousand immunomes project where he looked at cytokines or inflammatory markers in a thousand people from little kids to old people. And he found there were like things that we probably never heard about in medical school, these cytokines that you are know, we don't test for in a normal lab result, but that are actually are probably more predictive and, and more correlated with various age-related diseases than other markers that we actually do measure, right? So we may, we're kind of learning about how to test for this. Uh, and you mentioned high resolution scans, uh, imaging tests. We, now, for example, with Alzheimer's, we know that Alzheimer's is an inflammation in the brain. We can see through, through various MRI and, and high, high technology scans, we can see inflammation in the brain. Uh, we can see, for example, a new AI driven heart scans. We can see inflamed plaque where rather than just looking at oh an angiogram or you know even calcium score which gives you a rough idea of the, the calcified plaque it doesn't tell you how inflamed your plaque is so we're getting more and more sophisticated but you know are there are there tests that we should all be doing to check for inflammation and are there tests that help us figure out the why like what is the why behind why we're so inflamed i think that's a it's a certainly a top question for sure. And I think it's also very specialty dependent. You know, for example, in my own practice, I, I tend to see inflammation all throughout the intestinal tract. And so depending on what sorts of symptoms a patient's come in with, I may do endoscopic testing. I may do an upper endoscopy and a colonoscopy. And I, I may catch uh, microscopic inflammation in the intestines as well through that way. And there are also stool tests that we do in our practice to measure inflammation, uh, like lactoferrin, which is one of the stool tests. And these are very situation uh, dependent. And again, if you if you go to your uh, physician in general, you're unlikely to be told, hey, let's just check you for inflammation and then let's try to treat it. And we're not quite there yet, but I think we're getting there. And I think one of the interesting things too with testing is that, you know, perhaps we should be measuring inflammatory responses to challenges rather than just like a baseline mm. snapshot of inflammation. I think that's mm. something that could be very interesting as well, because we want to know that the immune system is doing its job when it should be and not overreacting as well. So I, th I think there are a lot of great things that will come up in the future regarding testing, and hopefully we'll see more and more specific markers and we'll see more trials in this space. But I think when we go to our physician's office, in the modern age, I, you know, we have some proxies that can tell us if we're inflamed and we have specialty specific uh, diagnostic tools that we can use as well. Interesting. So, so you mentioned sort of the, the sort of a challenging in the immune system. Can you talk more about that? Cause we know that, for example, if you want to check for diabetes, you do a glucose tolerance test where you give people a bunch of sugar and see what happens to their blood sugar. Or if you want to check someone's heart, you don't just check an EKG, you put them on a stress test or do a stress echo to stress their system. So tell us what you're talking about. I think this is a really interesting concept of how do we how do we test our immune system's function and are we overreacting or underreacting yeah i think it can be as simple as injecting you know a molecule like a lipopolysaccharide and and trying to figure out what the immune system's response is is the immune system one responding appropriately uh and two is it overreacting are we having too much inflammation to a stressor and i think that could tell us more than perhaps just a snapshot of the blood markers that we have currently. And this is something that I think maybe that we will see in the future. Yeah. Now we've all heard about the cytokine storm from COVID and cytokines are basically the messenger molecules of your immune system. And a lot of the you know, work by David Furman, things we're measuring like CRP, TNF alpha, IL-6, cytokines, they're just, they're just the, the uh, symptoms of inflammation. They're not the cause. They're the body's response to something that's irritating it right so my my question is you know is is you know why always why is the immune system pissed off in the first place right it's easy to measure look at you know you can look at scans you can look at a colonoscopy you can look at crp you can look at all these other biomarkers but it's not going to tell you the why and so, you know, my joke always is that a functional medicine doctor is really an inflammologist. Like I'm an inflammologist. <laughs> I think I've, I've, I've like made it my life's work to understand inflammation, to understand what causes it, how to actually remove the causes and how to the, get the body's own immune system to calm down and to, re, to reduce the inflammation naturally. So can you talk a little bit about, from your perspective, what do you see as the main drivers of this epidemic of inflammation and inflammaging, which we talk a lot about? I think 
I think, first of all, that, you know, this idea that all of these disorders share a deep biological link from heart disease and cancer to some cases of depression and neurodegenerative disorders, uh, that link being inflammation, it forces us to, to look at all of these things and really try to figure out what these root causes are. And it forces us also to look at patients and to treat patients not only from specialty perspectives, but also holistically in some ways as well. And a lot of what is causing this low level chronic silent inflammation today is our environment, our dietary habits, our lifestyle. And we know that chronic inflammatory disorders, and when I talk about chronic inflammatory disorders, I'm talking you know, not just about rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease, but all of these different uh, modern diseases, because these are inflammatory disorders. And, and so we know that our lifestyle factors play a very, very important part. So, so talk, talk more about, you know, specifically, what is it about our diet that's driving the inflammation? And, uh, and, and then I want to get into potentially exploring other causes that may not be immediately obvious to people that are driving inflammation. Sure. Think, your, your book is really Silent Fire, talks about diet as a big driver of inflammation. So exactly, exactly what are we talking about here? There are so many different factors. And I think one of the biggest ones is the Western diet. And this type of diet is loaded with an excess amount of sugar, salt, inappropriate fats, processed foods, processed meats, uh, refined carbohydrates. And the problem with this Western diet is that our immune system actually tends to respond to it as it would a germ. You know, your immune system tries and tries to, to kind of fix things in your body and it realizing that keeps getting these hits, you know, maybe uh, three times a day or six times a day, however many times a day you'll have a meal. And when we are eating this Western type of diet, we're also starving our gut microbes of their most beneficial nutrient, which is fiber. And fiber can manipulate all arms of the immune system from the innate immune system to the adaptive immune system. And it's an incredibly powerful, powerful uh, nutrient that we, that we need to be eating more of. But 95% uh, of Americans today do not meet the recommended daily allowances of, of uh, fiber. It's 28 grams for uh, females and 38, I think, for males. So we are really starving that microbiome. Then the microbes change their behaviors, causing inflammation. They'll inch closer to the mucosa. They will create more inflammatory molecules like lipopolysaccharide. Those molecules will go out into the bloodstream, causing body-wide inflammation. So it's changing you know, who the microbes are, the, the species in your gut, and also what their behaviors are. So the Western diet, one of the biggest losses is also the fact that we are depriving our bodies and our guts our, and our gut microbes of their most essential nutrient. So diet is certainly a very big component of creating this low-grade inflammation. And I would also say that the other main Not just problem, a lack of fiber though, right? It's probably other things in our diet. Right. Plenty of other things. And, you know, the other thing too, I would say is that we, we tend to think of foods as uh, dampening or creating inflammation, but there's also a reversal going on. This whole process by which inflammation tends to die down in the body is not a passive process. It's an active process and immune cells like macrophages and neutrophils will secrete new mediators and we need to feed that process. And so we need to eat healthy fats like omega threes. And I think that's something that we don't do enough of, uh, nearly enough of. So that potential to resolve inflammation in our bodies, we, we need to really be able to create those molecules. And that also comes from diet because the precursors of these lipid signaling molecules uh, are actually omega-3s, which we find in a variety of foods. Yeah. I mean, these are called the icosanoids, right? This is what we learned in medical school, these pathways of, of regulating cytokines, inflammation, uh, and they're highly regulated by the fats in our body, particularly the omega-3 fats. I, I want to loop back to what you, you earlier talked about, because I think it's really important. I don't want to skip over it, which is the role of the microbiome. And as a gastroenterologist, I think this is your area, which is the microbiome plays a huge role in regulating our immune system. And most people don't know that 70% of our immune system or 60% of anything you talk to is in our gut. And it's because it's the first place where we interact with the outside world, right? We put all this pounds of foreign stuff in our mouth every day and it goes down there and it has to be sorted through. And then you've got all this bacteria and bugs and poop in there and it you know, you have to let in the right stuff but keep out all the bad stuff. And when we get a problem with the microbiome, we tend to get damage to the gut and more inflammation. So can you kind of walk us through that whole story of uh, what we're doing to damage our microbiome besides 
just not eating fiber and, and what changes happen in our microbiome and how that starts to upramp the inflammation cycle in our body. Right. So, so, so when you look at the microbiome, when you see, for example, a um, mouse who grows in a sterile bubble with no microbiome, uh, no germs on that mouse whatsoever, you find that this mouse actually tends to develop all kinds of abnormalities like a deformed heart and lungs and a shrunken brain. So, so microbes actually train our immune system. They help our immune systems to develop. Our microbes are having conversations with our immune cells at all hours of the day. And this is a process that begins even before we're born. And once we're born, of course, and all throughout life. So we need to be having those essential conversations. And how do we foster those conversations? And again, it comes down to lifestyle. What kinds of foods are we eating? I had mentioned fiber, but there's so many other foods that are great for the gut microbiome, because we know also that a lot of the fats that we eat can make their way, some of them can make their way down into the colon. And we have that proportion of fats, for example, being metabolized. And we know that, you know, there are spices and herbs and all of these wonderful foods with polyphenols, which are amazing compounds for the gut microbiome, because again, some of those make their way down and are metabolized by the microbiome. So, so it's not just about the fiber, but all of these amazing uh, nutrients that we find in foods. And what we know today too, is that a dysbiotic microbiome or a microbiome that is an imbalance is very often an inflammatory one. So, so when you have microbial dysbiosis, when you're eating a poor diet and not exercising, you know, stressed out and not getting enough sleep or social connections, and you have a dysbiotic microbiome, we do know that you most likely have low level chronic inflammation coursing through the body in those states. So our microbiome is incredibly important for the inflammation picture as a whole. And our immune system shapes the microbiome as well. We know that microbes do so much in the body from digesting nutrients we cannot digest to changing gene expression to modulating the inflammatory response. Yeah, your 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 specialty has definitely got a new renaissance in the microbiome revolution. I mean, I remember speaking to gastroenterologists like, I don't know, 20 plus years ago, and they were like, really, you think food has an impact on what's happening in the gut? And I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what a concept, right? And I think now it's finally like, you know, I mean, it just amazes the doctors say, well, what you eat has nothing to do with your health. Like it's just, you know, your autoimmune disease, or your colitis or your whatever it is. It's like, it's not connected. And it's just, it's kind of absurd, but food is the biggest signal transducer we are interacting with every day. And it's either driving up inflammation or calming it down inflammation. And what we eat every day shapes our microbiome for better or worse. And so, you know, when you can have an inflammatory microbiome or an anti-inflammatory microbiome, and, and it's, it regulates everything from autoimmune diseases to heart disease, to obesity, to cancer, to Alzheimer's, to autism. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And so it maybe is probably one of the central things when I'm actually treating patients for any problem, I mean, that it remotely could be inflammatory. And, and then pretty much every chronic disease we have, I always start with thinking about the gut. I always like, well, how is their gut? Do they have any symptoms? What's their microbiome like? You mentioned lactoferrin, that's one test you can measure, but you can also look at the immune system in the gut. You put the bacteria in there. You can look at calprotectin, other eosinophil protein X, all kinds of biomarkers that can tell you if there's like stuff cooking and, and, and causing trouble. And you might, and it might not be a full-blown autoimmune disease in the gut, but actually, is something you need to pay attention to. So I think that's really important. The microbiome, I think, is one of the key factors driving inflammation and the challenge of the microbiome. What, what are some of the other things you found that might be driving inflammation, not, not things that make people, people typically think about? Well, I think one big thing also is just the stress in our lives. And you know, when we look at stress, we typically think of a bad boss at work or uh, you know, uh, bereavement, and things like that. One big, big stressor since the pandemic, though, has been just uh, loneliness, just or or lack of mm. social connections. And mm. I think this has been a huge and increasing stressor. Uh, being lonely, you know, can can be very detrimental to to the health. And uh, loneliness is tied to all different kinds of diseases, from heart disease and cancer to obesity. And it's a stress on the body. And inflammation can be one mechanism by which stressors like loneliness can cause illness. And what happens is, you know, it, it, it's not the acute stress. I mean, if, if, if you're faced with a saber-toothed uh, uh, tiger as in yeah. ancestral times, you know, you want to kill that tiger and, you know, 
go away, right? And and it's not the acute fleeting stress, but it's the it, it's these chronic, slow going stressors that occur day after day. And for a lonely individual, you know, their bodies are going to react to that stress as they would to a germ. And it's kind of paradoxical because when you look at these hormones going through our bodies in acute stress like cortisol and uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, uh, it's you actually have a dampening of the immune response initially, but but chronically, you actually have increased inflammation and you have increased cells, immune cells being made in your bone marrow. You have an expansion of white blood cells in the body. So this is what chronic stressors like loneliness do. And I, and I think also it's a systematic problem. It's a societal problem. It's not necessarily just an individual problem and problem that needs uh, systemic solutions. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's just, I mean, the social issues are huge. And I think in the blue zones, they live so long, partly because they have such a deep connected community and that helps calm down inflammation. Um, you know, I think that's really actually biologically really plausible. Um, yeah. I, I, I um, also want to ask you about uh, things that people don't necessarily think about connected inflammation. For example, environmental toxins. Um, what have you found around the role of environmental toxins and, and inflammation? Because it's something we can't really control as well as our diet or exercise or stress levels, even our social relationships. But it, it just seems like we're, we're in a sea of toxic chemicals. And what role is, are they playing in our immune system? You know, uh, I... I've been seeing more and more data, just, just studies coming out on, on some of these chemicals just in daily household goods, from everything we use, from our cleaning products to the clothes we wear, and you know, connections to inflammation in the body through those things as well. So, and then also just pollution in the air. And mm. uh, pollution we know is, is very detrimental to health, linked to a variety of disorders, and inflammation could be one mechanistic pathway by which pollution also causes disease. But I certainly think that environmental toxins are a big part of the picture as well. You know, it's the food we eat. That's a very, very big part. But it's also the air we breathe, how we live, and our household goods and our habits in that sense. So some of these chemicals in plastics, for example, or even in your exercise clothes. I think there was a new study that just came out on, on uh, chemicals in uh, polyester clothes that uh, folks wear for exercise. And so, you know, I, I really do think there there is utility to really thinking about everything that you're bringing into your house and trying to stick to natural clothing materials like maybe cotton and linen over mm. you know this kind of cheap and fast fashion for example uh, which has other issues associated with it as well and and i'm not saying someone has to be a hundred percent and avoiding every single chemical they've ever heard about but i do think that it's prudent to really think about what you're bringing into your home and and this also allows us to live a more sustainable and environmentally friendly lifestyle in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I'm on the board of the Environmental Working Group, and uh, there's all sorts of wonderful guys there, ewg.org, for how to reduce your exposure from household products, from skincare products, from food, from pesticides, you know, all the things that are, are really uh, causing potential harm. And, you know, even autoimmune disease, there's now links to, for example, environmental toxins and autoimmune disease through the mechanism they call autogens, you know, rather than antigens, we call them autogens or obesity or cancer. So all of these inflammatory problems can be triggered as well. Um, also, you know, from the diet perspective, what's your, what's your take on sort of the increasing rise of true food allergies as well as sort of food sensitivities and why we're seeing this and, and, you know, is there merit to it? And, you know, and as a gastroenterologist, you deal a lot with celiac disease. You know, what's your perspective on the sort of increasing rates of gluten sensitivity? I mean, there was a 400% increase in true celiac disease uh, based on a large study of 10,000 pool of blood samples from 50, 60 years ago to those now showing a real true increase. So can you kind of talk about that whole realm, because I think people really are confused about it and people think, you know, maybe get a little crazy about food sensitivities, but I, I think it's an important thing to think about. Yeah, I think, you know, there has been an increase in incidence of autoimmune disorders across the board, including celiac disease. And even in the last few decades, we're, we're seeing a steep rise in all of these disorders. And we know that many of these disorders have a genetic component, some um, more than others. But we also know that we've transformed our environments. So it's not just the genes and it's largely environmental factors. It's also driving this increase, not just in autoimmunity, but also allergies as well and food mm -hmm. sensitivities. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem is that 
when we are born and as we go through childhood, as we go through our lives, and the pandemic is a great example of this, we are not exposed to the microbes that we need to be exposed to. What we need to do is to be finding these microbes that evolved alongside humans in ancient times, these microbes that are found in uh, the air and um, uh, mud and the ocean. You know, Those are the microbes that we need to be keeping in contact with all throughout our lives. And there is a critical window during the first few years of life when we especially need all of these microbes to help to train our immune system, not to overreact against harmless particles like dust and dander, but mm. to actually accept what it should accept and to react against infectious deadly germs. So we need an immune system that's balanced. And I think to have that balance in the immune system, you know, we do need to be exposed to germs much, much more than, than we have been. And that means that we have to go outside. We have to be outside much more than we are. And yeah. it also means not being too, too clean in the house it means trying to uh, bring nature into the house as well. Maybe so when you drop food on the floor, you should eat it? Um, well, you know, <laughs> I, I, I say you not if, wash your um, vegetables? <laughs> well, you know, and, and and this is the hard part, right? Because there's a balance and it's, it's, it, it's tough because during the pandemic, we were, we were so, so clean and we were washing our hands a million times a day. And I think it's a fine balance, but one that can be struck because if you're, if you're going hiking, you know, in, in a, a, a place that you're very accustomed to, then maybe you don't have your kid, you know, do like a complete hand wash after that. You know, it's, it's not essential, but if you're in like a perfectly, manicured lawn, then then you sort of know that there's other things in there that you may not want your kids to have on their hands before dinner time. So it's really a balance. And of course, if we're living uh, through a pandemic, then it's important to to keep all those measures intact and to wash our hands and 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 to be very cautious. But at the same time, when we go outside, interact with those microbes, you know, in the forests and parks and hikes, we're actually boosting our immunity as well. So we do net... We, we do need that interaction even through pandemics and such. So I think it's yeah, a fine it's, balance. But you think there's a real truth to the increase in these food sensitivities and gluten sensitivity? They're not just in people's head? I do, because if, if, if you look at this rise, you know, it's, it's been in the past few decades. And if you look at how much these chronic disorders have risen, you know, the incidence of cancer, heart disease and autoimmune disorders, diabetes, I mean, across the board, you see, you know, a huge rise in all of these disorders. And and, you know, our, our genes cannot transform so quickly. And yeah. our environments, meanwhile, are continuing to transform. And, you know, just with the advent of processed foods, even, if you look at the 1950s, a, a dinner plate in the 1950s, you, you would not find the amount of processed foods that you find today. And these foods are, you know, they're kind of like Franken foods. They have so many additives that, you know, we do not understand. And, and it's, it's, tough also in healthcare and in medicine to try to prescribe lifestyle medicine and lots of folks are working on that and that's you know uh, the goal of all health and wellness practitioners but the system is set up so that it is just harder and more time consuming to implement these things um so that's a process an ongoing process as well but i absolutely think that we do have a rise in all of these disorders including autoimmunity because of our lifestyle in part yeah, it's true. I think there's some things that, you know, are, 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 you know, out there now that I think are driving inflammation and create a lot of chronic and sort of issues. And I think we've seen this with COVID, for example, you know, we saw this sort of wave of COVID, but you know, now that's calmed down, there's a whole aftermath of what we call post COVID syndrome or long COVID or long haul COVID. And, and that is an inflammatory condition that's real and it's making people feel like crap, you know, brain fog, fatigue, muscle aches, all sorts of symptoms. And, and so, you know, the other, the other thing I think that, that, you know, I think is driving inflammation for people are some, some of these low grade chronic infections, and it could be things like Lyme disease or other tick-borne illnesses, certain viruses that get activated if your immune system not regulated well, you know, COVID is a great example of something that kind of persists, you know, so what's your take on how we sort of think about looking for those root causes of, of inflammation? Well, I think, you know, especially as we age, it becomes harder for our immune system to fend off pathogens. And it's more likely that we may have some of these low level sort of infectious issues. So I certainly recommend, you know, uh, going to your physician and going to your specialist and getting a full workup for whatever it is that you do need. Um, you know, just 
just uh, being mindful of signs and symptoms at home, uh, uh, clinical signs and symptoms as well. And I think that's one of the best things that you can do. Yeah. You know, um, in terms of um, sort of another sort of take on this, um, the, the, you know, inflammation that we're, we're getting is, is, is an issue, right? We've, we've talked about diet. We've talked about stress. We've talked about toxins. We've talked about allergens. We talked about the microbiome. We've talked about infections, all things that are triggering inflammation. So as a physician, you have to be really good at being a detective about all these things, right? How do you analyze diet, exercise, stress, sleep, obviously lifestyle factors, but also how do you look for hidden infections? How do you look for hidden toxins? How do you look for what's going on in the microbiome? How do you, you know, measure what may be the root causes? But we also kind of have an opportunity once you've done that to live an anti-inflammatory lifestyle to reduce inflammation. So how is, as a physician, do you think about addressing this? Because it's not like take aspirin or Advil or take an immunosuppressive drug. <laughs> I mean, I read one study for depression where they were using, you know, basically these uh, TNF alpha blockers, these powerful biological immune suppressants to treat depression because <laughs> they thought it was inflammation in the brain. I'm like, that is the worst idea I've ever heard about. So can you talk about how, how we can start to think about, you know, um, reducing inflammation in the body? What are the tools we have to treat it? And how do we, how do we start on that process? I think for one, you know, if I see a patient coming into my clinic, you know, the first thing I want to establish is their baseline. What sorts of comorbidities do they have? And then also what kinds of GI comorbidities, you know, if you have, for example, intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you may have sensitivities towards certain foods that may resolve entirely after that overgrowth is treated. If you have things like microscopic inflammation of the colon, you may need to treat that first. If you are very, very stressed out and have had uh, major stressors in your life, and that could play a part in the types of foods you tolerate and your general health as well. So I think just looking at the baseline health of an individual is, is kind of my first step. And then from there, I, I do prescribe empiric lifestyle therapies. So I empirically prescribe uh, dietary and lifestyle therapies for patients uh, that can actually help them to live a more anti-inflammatory life. I think everyone is different. And, you know, I, I have patients... I had a huge population of patients at one point who were missing most of their intestines. So instead of having a 20 mm. feet of small bowel, they had 20 centimeters. And of course, dietary nice. recommendations have to be tailored. But looking at all of these different, you know, food sensitivities and allergies and food intolerances, you know, you really have to tailor the diet in those situations to each individual. And when you're looking at a global sort of a diet, a population-wide diet, because these are population-wide problems when we're talking about these chronic inflammatory disorders like heart disease and obesity and cancer. And, and I prescribe, you know, diets like the Mediterranean diet or the Okinawan diet. I, I think there's no single uh, size fits all type of answer sometimes, but, but the dietary patterns that we have today that are rooted in tradition are absolutely wonderful. And that's something I use to sort of personalize the diet for each patient, because I think in so many of these, these uh, cultures, uh, the ancient traditions do really support a diet that is very anti-inflammatory. It's true. And in a lot of the diet that's the most inflammatory is the amount of sugar, right, in the diet. And I think sugar and starch are probably the most inflammatory foods. And they drive that belly fat, which is a very different kind of fat that we talked about earlier. And I think that's the fat that's driving so much of the inflammation and, and uh, is a problem. You know, one of the most powerful things as a functional medicine doctor that I've done. And I think if I had like one tool as a doctor, if I only had like one prescription to give people for everything, it would, it would be, um, an anti-inflammatory diet, but a particular kind of one we call an elimination diet. And typically this has been sort of dismissed by most of traditional medicine, but, but I'd love your perspective on the idea of, of removing all the inflammatory foods and adding in all the anti-inflammatory foods as a strategy for treating, you know, a wide host of chronic diseases. I think certainly, you know, in in certain conditions, you know, uh, for example, with uh, uh, chronic food allergies and such, where it's not an immediate reaction, there are uh, food elimination diets that you can do. And in my population, I have patients with irritable bowel syndrome, and those patients have a, a certain elimination diets as well. Um, so, uh, so I do think that elimination diets do play a role in several conditions. When I, I see a patient in my clinic and I want to prescribe a broad anti-inflammatory diet, yes, of course, I take out all those Western foods, those processed foods, 
And I start slowly adding in some of these other foods that are higher in fiber. And I think one thing also to keep in mind is that it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, your gut can alter its secretions and its contractions over time to better process fiber. And that's something that for most people, uh, you know, if, if they start from a low fiber diet to 100% fiber diet, then they, then they kind of get discouraged initially. <laughs> and, and so that's one thing that I tell people to be mindful of. Um, but certainly I do use some elimination diets in, in my practice and, you know, for a variety of disorders. And I think it can be useful to keep a food journal to really try to figure out which of these foods are causing issues for you. So for eosinophilic esophagitis, which is an inflammation of the esophagus, uh, uh, we know that there is a type of elimination diet that can actually help that condition. And you can eliminate six foods at once or a single food at a time. So I try to go with a single food at a time and then reintroduce it back in a couple of weeks to see if that food is actually causing problems. And I think, uh, you know, patients can benefit from that as opposed to just starting steroids or, you know, starting a medication immediately after such diagnoses. Yeah, you know, I, I just recall a patient I had from a Cleveland Clinic a number of years ago who was sort of had a terrible autoimmune disease, psoriatic arthritis, uh, and had, you know, just you know, this is miserable with joint pain and inflammation and terrible skin lesions, but she also had, you know, prediabetes. She had depression. She had migraines. She had severe reflux. She had severe irritable bowel with bloating. And, you know, rather than like, and she was seen by the best physicians, getting the best drugs. She was on, you know, a $50,000 a year medication for autoimmune disease. She was you know, on any reflux medication, she was on antidepressants, she was on metformin, she, you know, like it was, a, she was a mess. And um, she came in to see me and she, she was, you know, these were managed, but they weren't better. And I said, gee, well, it seems like you have a lot of inflammatory diseases, right? Depression is inflammation, insulin resistance inflammation, psoriasis inflammation, arthritis is inflammation, your gut stuff is inflammation, right? And I'm like, why don't we just try to deal with the root cause? Or, based on your symptoms, which I, I sort of deduced to be her gut. And so I gave her, she had really bad bacterial overgrowth or SIBO. She had fungal overgrowth from all the steroids and antibiotics she'd been on. And so I gave her an, antifung an antibiotic and an antifungal. I cleared out of bad bugs in her gut. I repopulated with healthy bugs. I put her on an elimination diet, got rid of gluten, dairy, sugar, processed food, and gave her some probiotics and vitamin D and fish oil. And she came back six weeks later. And I thought, you know, I didn't tell her to stop any of her meds. I just said, why don't you try this? Yeah, you do. She came back six weeks later and she stopped all her medication. She had no more psoriasis, no more arthritis, no more depression, no more irritable bowel, no more reflux, uh, no more migraines. And her uh, weight dropped by 20 points and she reversed her insulin resistance. And, you know, um, I was like, wow, <laughs> this is powerful. And most you know doctors would not think about doing that, but it was just basically an elimination diet and a reboot of her gut that dealt with all these issues. And, you know, many of us walk around with things that are you know not as severe, but that would really respond to a trial and elimination diet. And actually that's why I wrote a book called the 10 day detox diet. It's basically an elimination diet that, and I, I use it over and over. And it's remarkable, like 70% reduction in all symptoms from all diseases, just using that approach. And it's almost like a reboot. And, you know, I find it so powerful and you can like eliminate one thing at a time, but I, 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 my philosophy is to try to like reboot, like, uh, like your computer's just not working. It's not, you can't just shut off one program. You got to kind of restart the whole thing. And it's amazing the level of inflammation that goes down, the fluid comes out of their body. Uh, they feel better, their skin gets better. And it's, it's something that I think, you know, most doctors should know about and learn about, but we don't learn anything about it. My daughter's in medical school now and, you know, she's oh, not nice. learning anything about nutrition, nothing <laughs> about what to do. That's very common. It's very common. I'm not even learning, yeah. not even learning about the <laughs> microbiome, which is like, you know, it's not exactly like alternative medicine anymore. And Well, you can teach her about nutrition. So I you try, know. trust me. I can't, get read one of, I can't get her to read one of my books. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. She's coming around. I think she'll come around, but she's, she's, she's learning. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, it's tough because it's like, we're so outdated in our practices. We don't have it incorporated a lot of this emerging science and your work, you know, your book, the sound fire, your article in time magazine, wall street journal were really great because they help people to see that we need to really think differently about these problems that we face as a society. Thank you. We appreciate that. So, um, you know, what are the other suggestions you have for people in terms of how to address inflammation? What are the sort of suggestions you have in your book? What are the kind of guidelines you use to help people think about this? 
So, so one of the other things too that we haven't talked about is just trying to do some exercise as much as you can uh, every day. And this doesn't have to be going to a gym and doing two hours of exercise a day and lifting hard weights. I tend to think of it as the Blue Zones folks would think of it, where you incorporate exercise naturally into the day. And we know today that exercise actually can dampen inflammation in the body. We have dozens of uh, clinical trials to back this up. And even in the absence of weight loss, the exercise can decrease the amount of immune cells that are infiltrating your fat tissue. And to me, that's an amazing fact because you know, we're not, we're not just looking at the no. end result, weight loss, we're actually changing our bodies on a biological level, even if we are not able to see it on the outside. And so just getting out and moving every day, even if you do it in small bursts, that tends to add up. Um, you know, uh, for example, if you, if you take the train, you know, if you uh, take your bike instead of uh, the train, or if you try to go up the stairs instead of taking the elevator, all of these different things can actually add some exercise in your day, some movement in your day. And when you think about the Blue Zones folks, this is how they incorporated some movement in, into their days. And I think it's a very seamless way to do it. And nothing wrong with going to the gym and exercising or anything like that. But for most people, it's it's this uh, difficult thing to begin exercising when they have not done any of it, especially some of my patients who come to me saying, you know, doc, I don't have time to incorporate exercise in, into my day. And this is something I think that anyone can do just by making some simple lifestyle changes and it can actually dampen the inflammation in the body. And mm -hmm. another thing too, I think, uh, is to just be mindful of the times at which you're eating because uh, fasting has been shown to dampen inflammation in the body, to fortify your body against a variety of, of uh, diseases. And and just something as simple as trying to consume your calories in a 10 hour window it doesn't have to be anything complicated. And of course, if you have comorbidities, then you should you know, uh, speak to your physician and a nutritionist before attempting a fasting program. But we do know that stressors like exercise and fasting are good stress in, in our life because we have to have the good stress and also uh, maintain the bad stress that we don't want. And those things I think are very important for inflammation. Yeah, I think that's really important to think about. I think exercise is so key, and I think we 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 you know we we don't realize how powerful it is as a as a trigger for all the beneficial things we want to have happen with aging. And it it works for depression, it works for heart disease, for cancer, for diabetes, for Alzheimer's, you know, for every kind of inflammatory disease. It's pretty amazing, and yet you know, uh, less than eight percent of Americans get the recommended amount of exercise. Right, I think maybe. Right. 20 something if you take a like a broader view of what's minimal but i think most people don't even get close to that um i think you know what about the role of um supplements or phytochemicals or other things that we can be taking to help regulate our immune system do you have any perspective on that i mean i i do love uh to tell patients to get their phytochemicals from uh from the foods first so so i basically you know i have my patients eat lots and lots of colorful vegetables we know that polyphenols are incredibly important phytochemicals for inflammation. They're antioxidants. They help to tone inflammation down in the body. They are also metabolized by the gut microbiome in part, and more beneficial compounds are created. So I certainly think that uh, polyphenols have a major role. And when I think about supplements, I think it's more the exception than the rule. So when you look at you know uh, uh, supplements like curcumin supplements, some of which have been shown to be efficacious in diseases like inflammatory bowel disease. You know, that's a great thing. And you can also use uh, curcumin in your cooking, for example. So I think with supplements, as long as you, you have the data behind them, then that could be something that is potentially beneficial depending on your disease process as well. You know, the, the things that I, I tend to sort of recommend people to eat are certain foods which have anti-inflammatory compounds. So what are your top anti-inflammatory foods that people should be focused on? Well, I really love greens. I think um, kale is one of my favorite greens. It has the immune modulating potential of our ancestors, um, our ancestral plants. And it's it's very versatile, very easy to cook. Uh, so we want to try to get to foods that are more like those ancestral plants, um, like scallions instead of onions, for example, because the ancestral iterations are actually much more powerful uh, from an inflammation damping standpoint. Uh, berries, again, are, are a wonderful food. You can have uh, frozen berries, for example, just in your in your freezer and eat them whenever you want. And they're filled with a variety of phytochemicals, including polyphenols. Um, 
And when you think about inflammation, you really want to think about the very, very colorful foods, not just the iceberg lettuce and the bananas. And in my pantry, I have a, a variety of whole grains. And by whole grains, I mean actually whole. So I, I love quinoa. It's one of my favorite grains. Um, and I, I think it's something that is very easy to use. And, you know, whole intact grains are actually much better for your gut microbiome than processed grains. So that's just something that's a nuance that that can be helpful when it comes to talking about inflammation and also fermenting. Yeah, fermentation. Yeah, um, a, a fermentation of those grains. So I think that when we are talking about uh, grains in general or certain foods, we really do need to be looking at the nuances. So, you know, if you have a hearty bread that's uh, fermented and baked in the ancient tradition without, you know, any flour, say, that's a very different response um, in, in terms of your immune response than a bread that you buy at the supermarket. And, and so that's something to be very mindful of. And I love beans as well and lentils. There are dozens of, you know, randomized controlled trials showing that uh, beans can help to dampen inflammation and beans have a good amount of soluble fiber. And you probably know all of this already. So I'm just regurgitating what you already no, know here. Great. So no, no, it's um, people need to hear it. People need to hear you know, it. Uh, but that's this podcast fiber is for me. Is it's important. for everybody listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so that soluble fiber is very important for the gut germs. And that's, uh, you know, they metabolize that fiber and yeah. you salvage calories that way. And you make beneficial compounds that mm -hmm. go throughout the body and calm the immune system down. And one thing I think that so feed, I'm gonna, I don't want you to skip over that feeding oh, your sure. microbiome is so important, right? It's and incredibly it loves important. Fiber, yes, and it also those polyphenols, yes. which is polyphenols. relatively new discovery. Yeah. So they, they they're exactly. not just eating fiber, but they're eating all the colorful plant compounds that can improve yep. their their um, bacterial content in there. And they're also eating some fat, like healthy fats from uh, nuts and seeds. And that's another food that I prescribe for patients. Um, you know, all those healthy mono one shot monounsaturated fats uh, and just a handful of nuts a day is a great thing to add into the diet. And then something I think that people tend to forget about are just spices and herbs. I mean, there are yeah. so many different spices you can use. And, and in my family's traditions, you know, the cuisines that my parents and grandparents cook, they're just an array of spices that I can't even, I, have, I still have to learn all the names of everything. <laughs> so, um, but spices and herbs are, are just filled with polyphenols and just very, very beneficial nutrients. You know, if you look at something like cumin, which has uh, salicylic acid in it, you're actually getting kind of some anti-inflammatory potential from that, which also helps to resolve inflammation because aspirin is one of the few medications that actually not only dampens, but also resolves inflammation. And, um, you know, just like uh, thinking of things yeah, like- Yeah, a lot of people were talking during COVID about using black uh, cumin seed oil. Like as a oh. black cumin seeds are a really different kind of a cumin and it's a very powerful immune modulator and anti-inflammatory, yeah. potentially antiviral. Yeah. So these, these spice and herbs, we, we sort of neglect, you know, we use a lot of salt, a lot of sugar, a lot of processed refined oils to kind of make food taste good. And we don't actually use the spices and then you don't really need that much of those other things when you actually have a yummy, spicy, yummy diet. I mean, I, I love to cook Indian food at home. I actually make it scratch stuff. So like I actually get the actual spices, I grind them, I get the peppers. Oh, that's wonderful. I get, yeah. And it's like, oh, it's so good. It's like, and, and it, it's, it's a lot like, of hard work. It's a lot of hard work. <laughs> uh, well, I have, a, I have a little, good like, for you. Uh, you know, I have a little like a uh, brawn like thing. It's just like, a, I just push the button and go, so it's, like, <laughs> it's fine. But it's, it's, it's so important to start to include these in your diet on a regular basis. Absolutely. And the one thing I want to mention, the last thing is also seaweed because I love seaweed and it's, it's oh. kind of like a superfood in some ways. And you can find fibers in seaweed that you don't find in terrestrial plants. And you know, yeah, the, goal tell us about that. A, the goal is just to have a, a diverse array of, you know, some of these plants. And we know that simply by increasing the diversity of plant foods in the diet, that can actually predict lower inflammation. So not, it's not just about the quantity, but also the diversity. So just kind of thinking about all of these different types of foods that you can get, I think can be pretty useful. I mean, people do eat sushi and they maybe eat a little seaweed, but what, tell us about seaweed because I think people don't talk enough about it. I'd love to sort of drill down on that a little bit if you can. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you, if you look at the Okinawan tradition, what you can do is just um, make a simple miso soup and put some uh, dulse or other types of seaweed in that. And seaweeds have a variety of uh, fibers that basically you don't find anywhere else. And you can use it as a condiment. You can just uh, sprinkle some seaweed flakes on, on anything you want, really. 
and it's very, very versatile and easy to use in all kinds of cooking. And it's, it's something I think that I eat probably on a daily basis. Uh, and, and I, I, I had not grown up eating it, but it's something I sort of added into my diet after a while. And I find that it's very easy to use overall. And yeah, it also contains all these polysaccharides and compounds that have anti-cancer properties, immune modulating properties. They also are great, you know, source of minerals and, and things that you can get other places. So definitely seaweed, fermented foods, you know, you mentioned a lot of spices. These are, these are all things that are in the plant kingdom that are phytochemicals that regulate our biology and people don't use enough of. So it's also, it's not just what you don't eat, right? It's like get rid of all the starch, sugar, processed foods, so forth that we talked about and low fiber foods. And, but also it's increasing all the foods that are, that are anti-inflammatory. And that's a really powerful strategy for people. I mean, but I would say that like, if you have something like a bad microbiome or you have, uh, you know, some low grade infection or you're exposed to some toxin or, you know, you have some real significant food sensitivity or gluten sensitivity, you know, you, you kind of have to deal with the cause because you can do all, you can eat all the kale you want. If you've got something going on, you got to deal with that. And I, I, I'm often sort of shocked. Like I had, I had one patient with colitis years ago who was, um, you know, doing everything right. I put him on all the right stuff, an anti-inflammatory diet, elimination diet, probiotics, everything. And he just was getting worse. It wasn't getting better. And I was like, what's going on? And I was like, well, maybe, you know, or something else. And so I said, let's check for heavy metals. And we checked and he had super high levels of mercury. We got the mercury out of his system. We chelated out and his colitis went away and he was good as new. And I, I've seen this multiple times. Another one with lead, who, uh, the woman who had Crohn's disease, really bad lead toxicity. And so, you know, we don't think of these things, but we have to kind of be really good detectives as physicians and think about, you know, why is the immune system so pissed off in the first place, right? Not like, not you know, what's the name of your disease and let me give you the drug for that disease, but actually how do I think differently about the root causes of what's causing this? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And we have sort of a uh, break and fix model of medicine often instead of a preventative model or even a uh, digging into the root cause type of an evaluation. So I think it's something that's evolving and we'll see more and more tests come out in the future, hopefully to test for inflammation and also for other issues as well that may be root causes of that inflammation. What are, you, what are you most excited about that you're seeing in this field that's coming around the bend around how we begin to assess and treat inflammation in a different way in medicine? I think I am very excited about uh, the microbiome research. I think, you know, just as a mechanistic for, uh, for inflammation to be a mechanistic link, you know, because when you look at the microbiome and uh, disease studies, a lot of these are associative studies. And uh, to really kind of, you know, understand a little bit more about the mechanisms and to see the science behind that, I think would be very interesting. I think the immune system is sort of ripe for investigation in that area. Um, and I would love to see more large scale clinical trials like Cantos for heart disease and, uh, you know, see if there are treatments potentially for certain conditions. Um, the FDA approved this year colchicine, which is an anti-inflammatory drug for patients with heart disease. So that's something wow. that's being, that potentially that's could be used. That's interesting. I mean, but I, I mean to, I, to me, that's a bit backwards because it's like, well, what about, you know, getting rid of the cause of the inflammation? Absolutely. And, an aspirin, and I right? agree with, I, I do agree with, you know, looking for the root cause and addressing those issues first. And I think one of the exciting things for me uh, is just looking at, you know, the fact that modern medicine has so much to offer from these multiple organ transplants to cancer immunotherapies. So I think we definitely should be focused on the preventative side and also try to be focused on the anti-inflammatory diet and lifestyle on the therapeutic side as well, because we know, for example, that when you have transplant patients like kidney transplant patients who, who take in the Mediterranean diet, they have a lower risk of graft rejection. So we know that even when you have some of those conditions, you may have a lot of benefit from managing your lifestyle. And I think as we age in this current environment, many of us are going to have artificial organs, maybe prosthetic organs, you know, and also immunotherapies and, and really learning how to manipulate our immune system through diet and lifestyle, which is a, which is a type of gene therapy will be very important because we are all turning into these new humans in some, in some yeah. ways. And, and we're facing ecological disasters like climate change and pandemics. And this type of lifestyle will also be beneficial. It's more resilient. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, it's pretty clear that the people who died from COVID were the ones who were inflamed <laughs> when it yeah. hit them. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you were healthy, you generally were pretty okay. You might have gotten sick, but you weren't going to die or end up in the hospital. And so, I mean, it's important for us to think about as a society, you know, what do we need to do to kind of reset and to learn from this? I mean, I, I was super frustrated with the, you know, the NIH director who recently re retired, Francis Collins, is an amazing guy. I love him in so many ways. But, you know, I said, why don't you use COVID as a teachable moment to help people understand the role of, of diet in, in driving so much of the, the morbidity and mortality from COVID? And he's like, well, you know, we don't want to blame the victim. I'm like, well, this is not their fault. I mean, we live in a toxic food environment that's caused by our food policies and food system. And, and we need to educate people on how to fight against that. And so, uh, you know, it was a little disappointing, but I, I think we really are at this teachable moment where we, we, um, we have this opportunity to really change how we're thinking about things. And I really applaud your work. I'm, I'm glad you're doing this in mainstream medicine at Columbia University and, and working hard to bring awareness around this. I don't know how you're being received by your colleagues. Are they, are they still talking to you? <laughs> they are. Yes. <laughs> I think, you know, honestly, I, I think there are so many more practitioners today who are very interested in diet and lifestyle. And there is just a gamut of evidence. You know, it's, it's hard to ignore the evidence of, you know, yeah. what nutrition science has taught us throughout history and also all of the new research on the microbiome as well. So I think yeah. there are more and more folks and, and also students in medical school who are very interested in lifestyle uh, medicine and inflammation, you know, which you've been talking about for a very long time, because I remember when I was a medical student, I think I came across your work and, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, it's a topic that has been talked about for a long time. And, and I think finally Western medicine is, is starting to take note as well. And I think it's great that you do work to bring awareness about this topic. And, and uh, I think it's important for uh, health and wellness professionals to band together because I think that is how the world is going to be changed. It's, it's not about, um, you know, if, if you look at paleo versus vegan versus uh, vegetarian diets, any of those diet labels tell you nothing about the actual diet. And right, right, right. you can have a responsibly designed diet in each of those categories of course, that, of that supports planetary health and that supports microbiome health. And I think that's key. And that's how I think we're all going to move things forward. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. 45% of adults and 25% of children, not obese adults, not obese children, all adults, all children now have a disease that didn't even exist 50 years ago.